I'm, I'm very excited to share with you basically the work that we have been doing uh, with this project to be to ignore. It's a global partnership in small scale fisheries. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time just sharing with you uh, what we have been doing and where we are at so that we can get some conversation about what you think we should be doing next. I'm really looking forward to you know, some inputs and also some feedback. So it's a big partnership, so it's going to require a lot of effort from everybody. And Andrew has been, you know, one of the main uh, contributors to the, to the project. So we'll see more of his work popping up there. So just to start with, right, we call this unpacking the 90%. Of course, this is the work that David Mills has been doing, you know, the Hidden Harvest, uh, which is now going to have part two. So it's all about do, what do we know about small-scale fisheries when we are thinking about fisheries? Are we looking at fisheries as a whole or are we actually looking at fisheries in the context of large and small? So of course we're claiming that there's a big number out there when it comes to small-scale fisheries. And many people have been trying to articulate it further and trying to talk about small-scale fisheries, contextualize that right within the world of Fisheries, so you might be seeing, you know, argument about how they are contributing to livelihoods, food security, and others, employment, and etc. So all those, right? All those are basically information, data, um, knowledge about small scale fisheries that are trying to help suggest that when we are interested in looking at uh, sustainability of fisheries, do we, you know, we're going to need to to pay a special attention to this particular se sector. So a comparative between a comparison between large scale and small scale is always helpful. So FAO and others have been, you know, doing this work, right, to suggest that, you know, if you look at fisheries as a whole, we see one picture. When you started to look at small scale fisheries and compare that with the large scale, you might see different things. And that is pretty much where we are getting our inspiration from when we're starting to say that, you know, if we are interested in sustainable fisheries, you know, are we going to have to spend, uh, pay a particular attention to this sector? So I study with Daniel. So this is the work that he had done at the time, you know, and he was at a clam even then, uh, which is World Fish Today. But uh, it is kind of like a, it's kind of one way to 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 make a case about you know the the, the importance of small scale fisheries. And of course, that is again a very important starting point for what we need to look at. You know, we need to be able to make these kind of comparisons between what you, what you know, the kind of benefits, the kind of impacts that that large scale and small scale are doing. But at the same time, you work with social scientists, anthropologists, and others. They're gonna want more than just the number, right? So it's not just about the number. You started to hear that they're going to be interested in these kind of questions. They're going to be wanting to know, but, but you know, when you talk about those 12 millions, who are they, where they fish, and why they fish. So all these different other, other aspects of small-scale fisheries become very important, especially if you are interested in addressing the issues and concerns that are affecting them. So you, know, you need to start looking at benefits, for instance, the distribution of benefits. We uh, need to look at other contributions that small-scale fisheries are making, their role and, and you know, impact they create on the environment, and also their role uh, on, in terms of stewardship. And then at the end, it's all about how to govern this sector so that they can really um, realize their potentials. So this is basically what we make an observation of, right? That when it comes to small, when it comes to going about fisheries, you know, as a either a fisheries ecologist, uh, fisheries scientist, or fisheries managers, right? We ended up doing, you know, we, we have a lot of imbalances in the way we go about it. Simply because, first of all, you know, there's a lot more systems these days in terms of data collection that really help us get the data. But they are really ten, you know, they're geared towards a sector that is a well organized sector that easier to get data, which is a large-scale industrial. So for a long, long time, that's all we know about fisheries. So those that are part of that commercial sector and small-scale are part of that, but, it is, you know, but they might not have the same landing records. They might not, you know, it's be a little bit more difficult to get to what's going on in small-scale fisheries. So with, without knowing about small-scale fisheries, then you cannot really set priorities 
appropriately. So there is a little bit of imbalance there when it comes to the priority in terms of research effort, in terms of policy, etc. And then, you know, when you the, when the think about research too, this is not to say that there hasn't been research in social science that trying to look at uh, small-scale fisheries, but when you look at the kind of funding that is being allocated to look at fisheries, you know, there's no comparison. And, and this is not just fisheries. If you look at uh, natural science versus social science, you will see a lot of imbalance there as well. Okay, so it's really difficult to get good research funding to support the work that needs to be done to address that 90%. And then, of course, you have then policy imbalance as a result of that because, you know, usually it's, it's a science-based or it's a um, policy that are made, the decisions, and etc. So unless we are able to produce a kind of science that would be useful for, you know, that policymakers consider uh, that, that, that they can access and they can feel that they can uh, understand it, then it's very hard for them to try to integrate that into their policy. So these are the different, um, the situation that we face as we are trying to develop a research project to address uh, the issues that are affecting small-scale fisheries. So how to really go about, you know, recognizing that there is a little bit of this imbalance is happening. So we got the funding from the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. So they started a new research program called Partnership Grant. So at the time, it was uh, you know, not really clear what they really wanted from, uh, from this kind of initiative. So we were the first batch that, was, uh, that received the funding. It's, it's, a, it's a big money for social science research. It's $2.5 million Canadian, uh, with a requirement that there would be a 30% match from our partners. So we decided to engage with FAO, CIFDEC, and you know, other local organizations, we're actually basically telling them that you know, we need them to help formulate the research questions, to, to, to really, and then, and, and then conduct research and, and follow through with, with the objectives. And the matching contribution actually can be in kind, not doesn't have to be cash. So the people who put real money is actually the Memorial University where we, we are situated because basically they fund research, uh, the students, and they basically pay my position. So we, we basically started from about uh, 65 researchers, and then we started to grow since we started in 2012. So the reason for that basically is, you know, we are arguing that, you know, if we have that many people around the world in small-scale fisheries that we need to really uh, pay attention to, then we need a lot more help from everybody. So the partnerships then established and trying to you know, basically elevate the profile of small-scale fisheries, uh, go against the marginalization, and then really contribute to you know, addressing the, the issues and concerns that are affecting them. So people like to ask us, you know, what do you mean by small-scale fisheries? So basically, it's, it's, a big, uh, it's a big diverse uh, world out there, right? So if you are going anywhere around the world, that what there are fisheries there will be the smaller scale and it could be relative compared to where you are and it's about everything not just the fishing but it's also the pre-harvest and the post-harvest and there's a lot to do with women and sometimes children so there are many many um, many aspects of small scale fisheries around the world that we look at and i just want to make sure that they are not just about developing countries so there are small scale fisheries in Canada, even though Canadian government might not say so, and I'm sure they are also in Australia, right? So indigenous communities in particular in many places. So that's a big, you know, really big scope for the kind of research that we need to do. So the task for us is huge in terms of how to really go about addressing, understanding first of all what's going on and then trying to unpack and, and, and know more about so we, we basically <coughs> set ourselves up right with this with this uh, structure. We said that number one, there's a lot of things, a, a lot of information, a lot of issues that in um, knowledge that is that need that we need to know where the gaps are, and then we have these big questions that would drive our research, and then we wanted to build that into our capacity um, development uh, initiative. So that's also about you know, knowledge mobilization. So just three main things, information, analysis, big questions, research, and also knowledge mobilization. 
and uh, capacity building. So when it comes to big big questions, right? These are kind of like you know you you see we we call these a transdisciplinary approach to research simply because you really need to look broadly. Small scale fisheries are not isolated; they are connected with everything else. Um, they also need to be looked at from the ecological uh, and economics and also the governance perspective, just like any other sector. But there are more so when it comes to things like, um, let me see, things like defending the beach, for instance, right? This particular one, we get a lot of uh, people asking, why well, are you suggesting that, you know, we, you know, they, is that literally that we need to do? And, and, and our research actually shows that there are a lot of displacement happening in small-scale fisheries. They are the first to go. They're the first to let go, they're first to get pushed out of their space, working space, living space. So when we talk to civil society organizations who work with us, they started to say, no, we really do need to defend the beach. So it's becoming part of what we do, which is to look at access and rights. But at the same time, we have you know, other bits like the economic viability, you know, how viable, how vulnerable the global change processes. We need to look at that. The broadening the scope is about understanding the values of small-scale fisheries and recognizing the embeddedness within the community. You know, they are really uh, very much engaged in uh, with what's happening in the local economy. So how to really understand the values of small-scale fisheries when people say they go after fish, do they really mean that fish for money, fish for livelihoods, fish for food, or what else that gives that meaning to them? Um, enhancing the stewardship is, is an interesting one because, of course, you know, when we talk about small-scale fisheries, we also have to recognize that they have impact just like any other fishing sector. But at the same time, we can also look at, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, what, what is the relationship that they have with their environment? What is that, you know, the concept of stewardship comes up very, very prominently in our research as, as, as we look at small-scale fisheries. And then at the very end, it's about governing the governance to say that, you know, if small scale fisheries are, are looking like this, then we need to think about them differently. We cannot just apply tools and approaches or even the same type of regulations that we use to manage the large scale industrial fisheries to small scale. So those are the big five research questions that underlie our research. And that's what we do in terms of, you know, uh, we call it thick description and lots of that. Lots of study, case studies. So I'm just going to run through the three main things that 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 are about TB, that TBTI aims to do, which is the information system, and then I'll show example of some of these large large scale multiple cases study comparison, and then the, the transdisciplinary training that we are working on. So it, it it's really about you know really about thinking about information in a very different way. You can imagine that if you just go ask anyone, what do you want? What do you think we you know, we need to know about small scale fisheries? I mean, you know, this need to know and about the want to know. It is a major when when you when you kind of ask this question. It took two years huh, before we can agree on what we should put in that information system. Simply because when you don't have such a system, you kind of want everything, and of course, setting up a system with everything would be would be a failure, you know, it's a failed attempt. So we decided that we would be very, very, um, you know, very cautious as we approach, uh, not trying to cover, cover everything, but there are quite a few things that we believe that we would like to see in that information system. We also saying that, you know, there is never going to be enough people going and collect data. So in order to have a good information system in small scale fisheries, you really need to take a different approach. And that's what we're doing. We're doing crowdsourcing. So, you know, if people are into that, you'll see there's a major risk there, right, in terms of, I mean, just like any crowdsourcing system, you really need to be able to reach out and be able to interact in that space and et cetera. So it's, a, it's a lot, also a little bit of a challenge. It's almost easier to do traditional data collection uh, in some cases than to do, depend on the crowdsource system. But that's what we use. So we build this information system through that crowdsourcing platform. Basically, we depend on the contribution. So we started it, right? We, we kind of mixed it. We started the populating the data, uh, we structured it, we populated the data on our, on our own, but then we really rely on people to contribute. So 
the contribute button is, is you know, it's, it's the only button that we want people to click. But of course, people actually would learn, get information. This is like, you know, you can go in there and, and explore, or you can just contribute and you export data as well we want. So we, again, took two years to develop, and now it's been running for two years. So it's a pretty rich database if you are interested in anything small-scale fisheries. So the first layer we put is actually about who's who. And we thought that this is the first place, good place to start. Everybody wants to see themselves on the database, right? You can have picture even if you want. So you have your profile there. And when we, when we start, stop, uh, when we, uh, you know, after we profile filing the researchers, then we profile um, your work. So there's a state of the art uh, layer. So papers, research, etc. that's happening in here. The most difficult layer, I mean, of course, you can view that in a map view, in a table view, and, you know, do, do things that you can you know, normally do with this kind of interactive information system. So it's, you know, crowdsource, open web base. This is probably the most challenging bit. After two years of designing the whole infrastructure, we still took another year to, to agree on what would be the most important questions if you wanted to describe small-scale fisheries. If now we say, people don't know what small-scale fisheries look like, and we say, well, through what, you know, if we are going to present small-scale fisheries to the world through this window, what, 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 what we need to capture? So it took a while to come up with these 20 questions. It's actually 20 plus because it's ABC, whatever, right? But we just called it 20 questions, right? So basically, there really are a lot about the four domains that we've always been working with. We need to know what's, how they interact in the ecological system. We need to know what they get out of it. We need to know what it means in terms of, you know, the, the social demographic, cultural, the values. And then, of course, you know, something on governance. So that has been a major work, and based basically, we we you know we have we have close to two hundred cases profiles now, so people can actually go and view the profile. But the percentage there is basically to see, and this is what we are learning, right? In terms of when people collect data about small scale fisheries, a high percentage basically are you know out of the hundred and fifty cases, people can talk about them. But women in fisheries, twenty nine percent, right? Um, other activities, income from small-scale fisheries, number of households, very small percentage. So there's still major, major, you know, research and gaps that we need to look at, right, to understand more of what's going on. Each profile, you can produce this kind of report, and this report basically captures the data, the 20 questions underlying that. So when you go into the system, you 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 produce, you know, the report. You can view, um, you know, the a profile about a place. So it can be a local scale, like you know, a crab fishery in Kanana or Kanana crab fishery. This is where it is. But uh, in Indonesia. But you can also look at you know different profiles. So this has been really interesting because it's it's becoming again, you know, it helps connect people from different parts of the world. So people who are sitting in Africa and Latin America looking at fisheries in Southeast Asia, right, and learn and, and figure it out and say, oh wow, we actually are very, very similar in some ways. All other things that you do differently, etc. So it's becoming one of those uh, learning and sharing tools. And of course, once you have all the different data, have more profiles, more case, uh, more data in the system, you can do this kind of regional synopsis and synthesis, which is where we are at the moment to really present information about what do we know about small-scale fisheries in that particular location or in the region of this is. Now, it's, it's good to have information. It's good to do that kind of, you know, build the system to, to talk at the very uh, overview level about, you know, small-scale fisheries. But the social science research is also about local studies. So we put a major effort in building a lot of case studies about small-scale fisheries, answering different questions in order to, to, to learn more about them and make that global comparison. And this is, of course, not, you know, we are, we are, we are a group of research network that are built, building really our knowledge on this existing work. 
that many people have been doing, and this is just example of the one that I've been involved with. Even before TBTI came to be, a lot of the literature comes from the governance, and this is, you know, one of the things that I think is very important to look at when it comes to small scale fisheries. To look at, you know, to think differently about the governance because it will then lead us right to do better at providing, you know, uh, helping them get out of the poverty and uh, and, and you know being more food secure, etc. Um, so, you know, doing this kind of thick description about the fisheries, major comparative work in this case, I mean, you know, in this particular volume, it's about 700 pages, right, of 34 case study studies. The most unique thing about this is that they're applying the same theoretical framework, which is interactive governance. This is the, the theory that I have been, um, you know, using and, 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 and applying into the research. So it has uh, it has really resulted in I and mean, this is you know a chapter from here as well by Pitt and Andrew. So it, 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 it was a, a different way to look at small scale fisheries because for a long time we have social science research doing it in one location and you know whatever ethnographic research or other quantitative research, well being and etc. Poverty, you name it, right? Livelihoods, things. But it's really hard to bring them together and then trying to synthesize and learn using that kind of a global comparison. So this has allowed us to do that. So it's been a, it's been a lot of work, but uh, we're happy to have it out. The next one, so, you know, that was 700. This is 800 pages. So it's like, you know, they're starting to grow the number of pages, both so beautifully as door stoppers if you need one. <laughs> but they also really, you know, really they tell stories about small-scale fisheries. Some of you may be familiar with the small-scale fisheries guidelines that have been endorsed, you know, we adopted that in 2014. This is FAO working with the civil society organization to try to come up with, you know, we used to have a code of conduct for responsible fisheries. Now we have a special set of principles and guidelines just for small scale fisheries. And they're very special. They're based on human rights. They talk about gender equality. They talk about, you know, things that matter in small scale fisheries world. So implementation of this, of course, is, is going to be tricky. And that's what this volume is trying to contribute to. What, you know, what would it take for each country or each location to Im implement the small-scale uh, fisheries guidelines? So, major work, large-scale research, multiple case studies comparison. There are, you know, real, real, uh, real uh, cover here. This new one on the social well-being is about many of the small-scale fisheries in Asia and a few other places. These are fake covers, but uh, they're coming, right? So one of our Latin America, this is a 20-some case studies, another 20-some case study in Europe. So with all those volumes, right, you can expect a lot more knowledge about small-scale fisheries that we are working on. But that's not really the only way to communicate our research, right? This is, we're very happy with this one. This is a collaboration between TBTI and World Fish and looking at inland fisheries and, you know, the work that Andrew is leading. So again, it has a lot of case studies about inland fisheries in, in uh, around the world, basically in, in, in Europe, in North America, as, all, as well as in, in, in Asia and Latin America. So to really produce these, you know, books, publications like this is ebook and other, you know, special issues and stuff. And then, um, and then other ways to engage with policy people, you know, through briefs and etc. That's, that's what, uh, that's what we have at the moment. Okay, so the, three, the, the, the third thing that, you know, in addition to the information system and all this big research, now we are talking about building capacity at the local level in order to create that uh, global impact. So this is something that we big on and we, we know that there's a dilemma. It's not easy. Transdisciplinary efforts is definitely a challenge, you know. We, we, we have a congress, right? We have a series of con conference now. Uh, it's called World Small Scale Fisheries Congress. So the first one was in Thailand in 2000, 2010. And then the second one was in Merida 2014. We're having one coming up 2018. You know, so it's, it's an interdis interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary conference, right? And you can see that the kind of, you know, Tension, <laughs> the kind of, you know, the kind of 
I mean, I, you know, many of people were very angry at me. I thought this is going to be about us. I'm just like, well, you know, it's for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's really for everybody. And then, you know, even fishing people come to the conference because they thought that that's for them. I said, of course, it's for everybody. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's never easy, right? Because we always, we have that, we have that. I mean, people are much more comfortable in their own space, right? We can talk discipline all day. But whenever you're trying to think about what we need to do to come together and stuff, it's becoming difficult. And definitely we are not the first to talk about small scale or transdisciplinarity. I mean, this has been, you know, I mean, I read about one conference in 1980 and they had 800 people talk about transdisciplinary approach. But maybe this is the first time we're applying that to small scale fisheries. So I really don't have good definition for it. I just know what we use as a working definition. And none of this makes any sense, right? This thing about going between, across, and beyond, and all at once. So people say, can you animate that? And so when I, when I go to do training on this, I do get people to animate for me. And I, I will have some video to show this at one stage, right? Because it, it's really good interpretation. Huh? You can really see how people talk about, how do you go between, across, beyond, all at once? But, you know, the holistic to address complex social problems. But this is a good point. We are into transform, transformation now, right? We are talking about innovation, transformation. So that, that's, that's, I think, what the trans disciplinary perspective can help us. And I wanted to just note, right, that even us, I mean, we work, we, we call ourselves an open transdisciplinarity because we do have um, fisher organizations, fishermen, fishing people themselves, and policy people taking part in this process of developing this, you know, the whole research with NTBTI. Even those, even those big five questions, huh, they didn't come from us. They came because we had the first Congress, then we ran a 100 question survey, then we organized regional consultation around the world. So it took two years to put the proposal together and develop those big five questions. So it's, it's a very much, uh, you know, a bottom up process. So, um, and then we have this kind of, you know, big Venn diagram looking at governance, social, social. Um, excited about this because we are going to put this up as part of our online open education. So if you have spare time, don't know what to do, with, you know, on a weekend, you definitely can become a resource person to us, right? Have a video talking about concepts. Any any of these concepts still need populated, right, to be populated in terms of what it is, what it means for small-scale fisheries. So it's, it's, it's as open as it's going to get in terms of concept uh, and trying to, you know, get case studies as well to put in this online learning platform. Okay, I'll do a little bit of reflection just because it's sort of like we are, you know, we just have about a year and a half to go in the project, phase one. Okay. How we answer all these big questions, right? And this is this is always a challenge because you know when it comes to these complex social problems that we're facing in small scale fisheries, there would always be more questions that we need to answer. But I'm just going to show you one, and this is just you know this is an example of the effort that we are trying to do to speak more about small scale fisheries in ways that might gain traction. So I don't want to say that subsidies is the only thing, but when it comes to economic viability, at least, we would recognize right, that the distribution of subsidies around the world would matter you know, in terms of the viability of small-scale fisheries. Um, the work that uh, one of our uh, no, she's graduated now, um, Anna, she did uh, research with Rashid, and then we put this paper together and really talking at, you know, it's a global study. It's the way the Zero Last Project like to conduct the study, right, at that level. But basically it's showing, right, that again, this imbalance between the, the you know, the kind of subsidies that the small, large-scale fisheries get and what small-scale fisheries get. And then um, the fraction, you know, so that this is important, this is already interesting. But what is also very interesting is the way these subsidies are being used. Um, this is Europe, right? So I presented this to, uh, to the EU, and they basically said, this is not true, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, tell me, right? Which one is it that you don't agree with? So it's been, uh, it's been good in that way to, to use as an engagement tool <laughs> with the people. Okay, 
So the broadening the scope, the values. This is this is a pretty interesting work, right? This is something that Andrew has also been contributing to. Um, the meaning of small is a new publication, the uh, the e-publication. Basically, it's asking um, small-scale fishing people and organizations working there to tell us, right? There are many, many different types of values. We learned that from the typology that Andrew has done, and now we wanted to know how important those different values, the meaning that you have. So. In this particular case, this is a, a student, uh, well, former student, uh, he's already a professor now in Bangladesh. So looking at, for these particular fisheries, there's a sense of freedom that is really meaningful for the small-scale fishing people. There's enjoyment and pleasure, gender equity, community cohesion, and sense of place. So we're starting to see a lot of that information happening. And uh, this, this uh, publication includes about 20 some case studies around the world to speak about these kind of issues. Ah, right. So this one, uh, you know, I, I have this other life, right, that I, I, I do impact assessment, as Andrew suggested. I also do impact assessment of fishing gears. So you, if you know about the shifting gear study in the U.S. and then another study in Canada, we're looking at, uh, you know, impacts of trawling and other kind of gear. So we, have, we haven't done that to small-scale fishermen. And again, it's, our, it's really our belief, right, that you need to look at small-scale in the same way you look at large-scale. So therefore, we are now starting to do the assessment of small-scale fishing gear impact. And so far, it's uh, so far so good, right? Lots of greens. These, these are, sorry, you might not see that. These are all small-scale greens compared to the large-scale and these other different countries, you know, usually. Um, so uh, data set is still limited. You know, most of these are from Brazil, Mexico, Thailand, and a few other places. So this is going to have to be a continuing work in terms of looking at environmental impact. Okay. Defending the beach, this is uh, you know, definitely a struggle for a lot of communities that we work with and our partners. Masi Fandise is an organization, a community, a community, um, it's a national organization based in Africa, South Africa, sorry. Uh, they came up with a policy on small-scale fisheries even before the guidelines came into effect. But basically, they needed to get that kind of mobilize that, get that implemented into the in, in the allocation. So we work with with them and also with the Institute for Poverty, Land and Agrarian Studies, also based in South Africa, to come up with a handbook, a policy brief. So basically, South Africa came up with a national policy. The people want to be able to engage with it. So they said, let's turn that into something they could understand. So that's, that's the work that we have been doing. And that has been used quite effectively for people to if, you know, working to defend their rights. Um, from the econo uh, more academic-oriented perspective, we have the work by Evelyn Pinkerton, who is a leader in this uh, particular research, and she's you know, now two volumes now on, uh, on these access and rights issues in marine policy. Governing the governance, this is, uh, this is my own work with uh, my uh, colleague, Sven Yen Top. So we have been analyzing those, uh, you know, case studies that I told you about the 34, and now we are trying to do a little bit of a typology to look at the transformation and also the the the, the, the you know the, the the way we gravitate towards in terms of the transformation of uh, of the governance system. So we are now really seeing a lot of that um, movement, right, from a different, you know starting from you know, some uh, groups that are paying attention to the first order of thing, you know, just a day-to-day -day operation, a lot of uh, a lot more now in the second order of things, institution and regulations in terms of improving governance. So that's that, you know, we'll, we'll write, this paper should be coming out soon, I'm hoping anyway. But have we really made any impact when it comes to policy? This is my, you know, I always like, what are we going to do here? So we kind of we kind of do we kind of do this, right? We go to conference and we launch our books and be happy. We go to FAO and we have to talk with big big guys and I don't know how they're happy about that, you know, whether they're happy or not. But you know, Nicole Franz is one of the editors of that book. So no matter what, if we all come up with the guidelines, they have to support it and we need to work on implementing. So in some ways we're working very close with them. This is what I like because it's a Senate launch. So this is a senator in Mexico. Remember that this is, you know, 
800 pages book. So he's a very strong politician, right? <laughs> and he was holding that just like, you know, I don't think he read, I think he read the cover, maybe the back cover <laughs> a little bit, but he was so happy about that I turned out. And it's got like news everywhere that, you know, the senator is doing that and it's, you know, it's part of political campaign, but that's fine. We want them to implement the guidelines or whatever it takes. Have we made any impact locally? We are doing that, right? A little bit, like I said, about you know working closely with some of our partners, but uh, you know bringing bringing organized uh, groups together has been really a, a nice way to think about this as well. People are, are enjoying the you know the space that we provide through our network to communicate, to share information, and of course there's more work to be done, definitely at the community and grassroots group level. Okay, so last part now. What's next? Um, TBTI, after that structure of the working groups that are addressing the big five questions, our, through our halfway midterm review, it, it turned out that in addition to those you know, darker color bubbles, we also need to do more. And this is when you started to see the network started to expand. So, you know, Inland Fisheries came and they was like, I do it, so he's helping us with that. The guidelines came, so there is a, you know, it was a need for that cluster market opportunity, right? I mean, we need to make small scale viable. There's a lot of things happening when it comes to markets and there's lots of innovation happening. Not just these community based or community supported fisheries alone, but you know, different different ways of thinking about these I call it in Tenerife and now you know, trying to help marketing the two, local tuna that they catch, putting that into the school uh, as part of their uh, lunch program. Uh, we are launching our event in Malta to work with the culinary school to try to do good things. Transboundary interactions, there's a lot of governance issues about that. Indigenous fisheries, you know, we didn't think that we should have a cluster there, but yes, that, that was the needed one, same as the women and gender. Definitely a lot of issues in that that we need to look at fisheries food and then global change responses. Those are basically to say that, you know, small scale fisheries, as much as we, we like to think of them, they again, you know, they are part of this big world and they need we need to understand that dynamics and help make them as as, uh, as strong as possible. Okay, more work to do for the guidelines perspective for sure. I mean, you know, having the guidelines is good, we need to implement. And that's what, what we need to uh, you know, working on. More. From the research perspective, there's a lot of what we consider gaps analysis that needs to be done. We're not going to be able to see these topics uh, too well, but basically, you know, we are doing a pretty systematic assessment of what's been there in terms of the kind of research interest. So we continue to populate this data set to look at what, what, what has been, you know, less, uh, some areas that receive less attention and some, some areas would have received more, so the darker color is, 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 is where we do more research of, like livelihoods across the board here, which is very interesting. Participation, right, also across the board, almost. Okay, so that's good. Um, this, is, this is another one that got the European uh, EU starting to like, this is when they walk out of the room. What do you mean, governability <laughs> index? But you know, people don't like to be compared, it turns out, and I, I mean, I'm coming from the research where we compare everything. Pairwise comparison is my thing. I say, oh, I'm going to compare 20 countries around Europe and see how they, how they fare. And, you know, some of us are very familiar with this kind of analysis and we have no qualm about it. But, of course, there's a lot of things to look at in terms of what's going in the social system, the natural system, governance system, and etc. So it's just an early work. I have a student now in Mexico who's suffering uh, this because I said, we're going to do a governability index. And now she's looking at 30 communities in Mexico. I think it's a great study. Okay, so coming up eventually on that one. And then, of course, how to speak with policy, how to really send the message. Um, I never liked it when they said that we need to, you know, simplify or whatever. I think they need, you know, they need to have all that complex, complex, uh, you know, all the complexity they need to realize, they need to appreciate. But we still need to hook them somehow. So we'll put out this kind of, you know, big number again in our little brief and see what, uh, what they want to do, how, 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 you know, where they want to go from here. And then we come together, right? This is, this is, if you don't know, if you don't have these dates in your calendar, mm -hmm. 
Mm. And you want to hear more, you want to interact with all those people we work with, of course, do join us. This is going to be about transdisciplinarity, transformation, and the future of small-scale fisheries. So, Too Big To Ignore is partnering with World Fish to organize this meeting together with our local hosts and FAO and other partner organizations to make sure that we really get together, talk about, you know, do the science, what they call symposium, do a policy forum, a proper conversation with policy, provide space for community to have their talk circles and to interact. And yeah, there's going to be a lot of fun storytelling and lots of, you know, cultural exhibition as well. And then this is our attempt, right, of the fisheries, small scales are marginalized. But of the small scale, inland fisheries are marginalized. So we are going to this inland little lake, you know, little lake in the north of Thailand. That's why the conference is in Chiang Mai. People were thinking that we're going to go to the beach, but, you know, not really. <laughs> so we're going to walk around that little lake instead. So that would be our program. I'll stop there and invite some uh, questions and comments. Thank you.